course, I'm a cool weather person, and uh, this hot weather had just about got the best of me. And I love seeing these cool mornings when you get up this morning. Well, it made me want to come to church. That's what it done. Of course, when I got up and it's hot, it made me want to come to church. So I'm glad I'm here at Gospel Tabernacle today, and it's good to see you. We've got a lot of things in store today. No telling what the Lord will do before this day is over. I'm looking forward to a great day in the Lord. Uh, kids, you can go ahead and go to your classroom. The ones that's not back there, they can go ahead and go to their class. Glad to see our children this morning. Excited about going to Sunday school. Let's all stand this morning. Go to the Lord in prayer. Do have several requests to remember. Sister Markle, let's keep remembering her in our prayers. Now, it's good to see Sister Betty Gilmore back with us today, but let's continue to remember her in our prayers. Good to see Brother and Sister Haightley and Sister Wilbanks with us this morning. Continue to remember them in our prayers also. Uh, let's remember Sister Sellers in our prayers. Uh, let's don't forget uh, Brother Hodum's brother, Joe Hodum. And let's also remember Brother Tracy Newman. Uh, that's up in uh, Mountain City. Let's continue to pray for him also. Anyone else have a prayer request we need to remember? Sister Sellers, remember her. Let's remember Brother Colin in our prayers. Anyone else have a request? Let's remember our service today that the Lord would uh, really give us what we need in the Lord. And I believe he'll do his part if we'll do ours. That's usually the way it is. He's ready to do for us if we'll just do for him. So uh, let's do that for uh, the Lord this morning and see what the Lord has got for us in our service. Also, Mr. Frank Berry passed away last night, and I don't know how many of you all knew Mr. Frank Berry. He'd been a businessman here in town for a long time, but let's remember his family also in our prayers as we go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Josh, pray for us this morning. We're so thankful for this day. Thank you, Lord, for being our God and our very present help in trouble. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with whatever is bothering us, whatever problem we have, and we can trust that you'll take care of it. Lord, I know you are the answer. You are the way. You are everything that we're seeking after, and we reach out to you today, believing that you will hear us and respond to our cries. Lord, I ask that you be with those that are traveling today and keep your hand of protection upon them. Lord, those, Lord, that are wayward today, I ask that you just draw them unto you. But, Lord, every need that was called out, every need that was mentioned, every need that is represented on these pews today, I ask that you minister to. Lord, anoint this service, anoint our worship and our praise, and allow the preaching to speak into our lives. And for this, we'll be giving you all the praise and glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. I hope you're as happy to be in church this morning as I am. I hope you was as happy to get out of the house this morning, and I love the house. It's all right to be home, but when I stepped out on the carport this morning and that cool weather hit me, and I thought, what a, what a morning to get me a cup of coffee and sit down out here at this table, but I didn't have time. Maybe tomorrow morning, but I love this kind of weather. In fact, I think October is my favorite month. It, uh, it comes right in front of the rest of them. I'm just glad to be alive, tell you the truth. But I'm glad you're in church, <clears throat> and I look forward to today. I, it just feels good to feel good, and I feel the presence of the Almighty God. This morning, I'm going to begin reading in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, uh, for Bible students, Exodus 33, may, you may not remember exactly uh, without starting the reading, but once we start it, it's going to be, this is a, this is a mainstay. I mean, it's, it's a very powerful chapter. It's one that gives us much insight into the rest of the Word of God. So I, I've always enjoyed chapter 33. I say always, let me say for a number of years, it has been a uh, great chapter for me. 
But some of the times I forget exactly if it was 33 or what until the last few years, and it became so prominent until I remembered that it's chapter 33. A lot of things, and we're not going to cover it all. We're only just going to cover a small portion of it, but there's a lot of things revealed to us in uh, Exodus chapter 33. Uh, God just makes himself known in, in such a precious way uh, unto Moses, and then Moses gives it to us. I want you to remember before I read something that said, those things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. It should never be lost. Once God makes a revelation to any one of us, it should never be lost. If these things have been in your day, Joel said, tell it to your children. Let them tell their children. Let them tell another generation. And then throughout the scripture, there was certain memorials that were built. And one of them in particular is the stones that came out of Jordan River. And they pitched them in Gilgal, which was the first night's lodging into the Canaan land. And when they made a monument of those stones, the Lord said, now when your children come and they said, what do you mean by these stones? What, what does this mean? Why is this pile of stones here? What's this monument for? You're to tell them that you come over that river dry shod. Well, every one of you that's got a child and uh, of any size you or have raised them, you know how inquisitive they were. You cannot satisfy their hunger for knowledge when they're at certain ages. They're just, you, you can ask them something and they'll have another question by the time you get that one asked. So can you imagine when some child come by and they say, what, well, mama, what's this stone? So daddy, what's these stones? Well, this is to remind us that God brought us across Jordan River and it out of all of its banks, he brought us across dry shot. He stopped that water and let us cross. And they're going to say, what was you doing over there? Well, I was 40 years in the wilderness eating manna that rained down out of heaven. I mean, we didn't have to sow nor reap, but God fed us, a whole multitude of us, for 40 years in that wilderness. What was you doing in the wilderness? We had crossed the Red Sea back over there just like we did this river, dry shod. God worked a miracle, parted the waters, and they actually stood on this side and on this side and let us cross. What was you doing on the other side of the sea? We'd been in Egyptian bondage for 400 years, but God brought us out just like he promised Abraham. By this time, the child knows the history of Israel, and he also knows that the promises of God never fail. Amen. It ought to be in our lives, folks. There ought to be things in our lives, and we should be able to tell our children these things in such a way until faith is built in them, and they know that God will never fail. I, I had an older brother. Uh, I barely remember him. He died in the army back in 1952, preparing to go across into uh, Korea to the Korean War. But before he died, uh, he was healthy up until just weeks before he died and come down with acute leukemia all of a sudden. And they were preparing to, you know, they were getting themselves in shape to go across. So he thought it was the long hours they were working. He just stayed tired. And then by the time they realized that he had leukemia, he was just within days of death. And, uh, but while he was still in health, this story was told to me. He didn't tell me because I, I barely knew him. I remember seeing him alive one time because I was only five years old when he died. But uh, he uh, was in the barracks and there was somebody in there making fun of people that talked in tongues. And he told them to hush. And of course, in a few minutes, it all started back up again. And he got up out of his bunk and he said, now, the next thing you say about somebody talking, he said, I don't talk in tongues, but I've got a mother and some sisters that do. And if I hear one more word about it, I'm throwing you out of this barracks on your head. And they hushed. I mean, it was either that or fight. But he knew, he said he knew it was real. Well, you couldn't live in our house without knowing the Holy Ghost was real. And that's just a fact. You, if you were brought up in, in our home, it was evident to you that God answered prayer. It was evident to you that God was real and that uh, mother's faith was uh, powerful and that uh, God listened when she prayed. And uh, kind of like that old song, when mama prayed, all heaven paid attention. 
And that was evident in our home. I, and you know, we, we saw the handiwork of God from time to time. I, my only regret is that I didn't see my daddy pray and didn't hear him pray and didn't have the, uh, didn't see the effects of, of a joint house of prayer. But we knew there was a, a child that was raised in our home that didn't know that the power of God was real. And we need to leave this heritage to our children. It needs to be passed from one generation to another. But let me read to you here. Exodus chapter 33. Let's get the setting of this before I read, okay? Moses has been on the mountain, Mount Horeb, also called Mount Sinai. Those words are used interchangeably. Also, it's called the Mount of the Lord. And uh, he's been on this mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's received the Ten Commandments written in tables of stone, written by the finger of God. And on their way down, he, he hooks back up with Joshua, which had went part of the way with him. And uh, Joshua says, I hear something. And he's listening and he said, it's not the sound, it's a sound of war, but it's not the sound of someone being overcome in battle. And neither is it the sound of victory. But I mean, you know, it's a sound of war, but it's not, uh, an overcomer's cry, and neither is it one that's being overcome, crying out in distress. Well, what he couldn't understand, there was spiritual war in the camp below. And it wasn't the natural overcoming, but Satan had gotten in there. They had built them a golden calf, and they had stripped their clothes off, and they were worshiping the golden calf and dancing round about it. And it looked like the devil had won the battle. When Moses got a little bit farther on down the mountain and saw what was taking place, he threw the table of stone down and broke the table of stone. Now, the children of Israel broke the commandments. He broke the stone. Remember that. He didn't break the Ten Commandments. He broke the stone that they were written on. The children of Israel had already broke that first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And of course, Moses hewed out a new table. That's all he broke. So that's all he had to repair. He hewed a new table. God did the writing again on the table of stone and put it back on there later. But now they had just got down there. And of course, there was a lot of uh, things took place. He uh, ground that calf up, put it in the drinking water, made him drink it. He had several of them slain for uh, turning the camp of Israel aside and uh, you know, it brought order back into the camp to a certain extent. But God was so angry when this happened, he told Moses, he said, I'm not going up among them. You take this people on up, but I'm not going up among them. They're a stiff-necked people, and I, I'll get angry and consume them in a moment. And so Moses took the tabernacle, and it wasn't even called a tabernacle before this, and it wasn't the glorious tabernacle that was built shortly after this. But he took the tabernacle that contained their uh, uh, table of stones now that he had, uh, well, actually, they wouldn't, and he had just broke them. But the, the remnants of their covenants with God and their, their artifacts that uh, reminded them of God, and he moved it out of the camp because God said, I won't go up among them. The children of Israel mourned and they wept because God had judged them unworthy of his presence being with them. And he moved it outside of the camp. And when Moses talked to God then, he went out of the camp and every man got up and stood in the tent door and watched him as he went out of the camp to the tabernacle and he worshiped God there. And a cloud came and stood in the door of that tabernacle until Moses came back and then uh, the cloud moved. They recognized that this is God and they recognized we have done wrong. And they mourned for the wrong that they had done and uh, God said he was still about to destroy them. And he said, don't put your ornaments on. That's your decorations, your jewelry, and so forth. Every man stripped them off. And he said, I want them off that I may know what I'm going to do to you. They, they represented their haughtiness, their high-mindedness. And they, they humbled themselves before God. And this, this is one of the reasons that jewelry now still represents haughtiness and high-mindedness and uh, you know, we get to feeling like we're something instead of depending on God. It, it does not represent humility. So God even told him, said, you strip it off of you so that I'll know what I'm going to do to you. 
I don't destroy you in, in a moment. So they did, and then we have this Moses with such a, a failure feeling. And you know, I hate to think, this is, a, this is a man that stretched his hand out over the sea, and, and the sea parted. This is a man that talked with God at the fiery bush, and the bush didn't consume. And by the way, that bush was here at this mountain also. He said, you're going, this is going to be a sign to you in three months after you come out of there, you're going to worship in this mountain when he was talking to Moses at the burning bush. So he's back at that place now, and he's met with God, and this, this mountain has uh, given him uh, an idea of God and a vision of God that he had never had before. And so, but now he's so discouraged. And the, uh, the Lord spake to Moses face to face, verse 11 as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but the servant Joshua, the son of Nun, the young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou, sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know what, whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. So Moses is saying, Now, Lord, I need help. I'm, I'm, I'm a man that's just unable to do this task by myself and you haven't let me know who you're going to send with me. Actually, when we go back through, if you'll remember, he said, you're going to meet Aaron in the wilderness and Aaron's going to be a prophet and you're going to be as God to Pharaoh. So, I mean, Aaron's going to help you. You said you couldn't speak good. Aaron's going to help you. But Moses is not, he's not at all in a victorious state of mind right now. I mean, it... It looks like all he's done, and remember he's 80 years old. Two-thirds of his life has passed. He's going to live to be 120, even though he may not know that at the time, but he's 80 years old now, and he, he's discouraged, and he said, you, you told me to bring this people up. It's too big of a job for me. I don't have any help, and you, you've not even told me who you're going to let help me. In verse 14, and he said, my presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? And so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all people that are upon the face of the earth. Still makes a difference, folks. When God called us, he said, Come out and be a separate people. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you, saith the Lord. The presence of God makes the separation. Sanctification, the word sanctification actually means separated for a holy use or a holy purpose. We're sanctified by the Holy Ghost. We're set apart. The scripture said we are sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So we're set apart from the rest of the world by the Spirit of God on the inside of us, and we're there for the holy use of God. And verse 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing that thou hast spoken of, and thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Very important. I don't have a lot of time to dwell on this, but there's such a great lesson right there. But he's saying, show me thy glory. Notice something. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. Moses didn't say, show me thy face. He said, show me thy glory. And God said, you can't see my face. I want you to notice something. The first scripture I read to you was the Lord spake to Moses face to face as a man speaking to his friend. So in that sense, Moses had already come face to face with God. And he had this uh, communication with God just like a man talks to his friend. Like you and I would stand there and talk to each other and look one another in the eye, in the face. But then why? Why down here God says you can't see my face? When you, when you consider this, and he's saying show me your glory, and he said you can't see my face, 
it automatically, if you remember the scripture in, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's glory is in the face of Jesus Christ. Not in the physical features right here, but at this time it was in the future, in the front. Which way are you facing? What are you looking at? Where are you going? So God is telling him, you can't see where you're going. My glory is yet to be revealed in what I'm doing here. I've got great glory over Pharaoh, and you've seen the wonderful works of God here, but I've got greater things than this for you. Now, I want you to also remember the promise when they started rebuilding the temple of God after the Babylonian uh, captivity. They come back and they laid the foundation and there was weeping and the old folks were crying and weeping. Remember, they were gone 70 years. So this was real old folks. They were crying and weeping and at the foundation being laid, and they remembered the house and its former glory. And uh, they, they knew that what we're doing here and this pitiful foundation is not going to support a house like we did have, the one that Solomon had built. And they, they were weeping, and then there were others that were rejoicing, and you couldn't hardly tell the rejoicing from the weeping, but they re recognized we're not building a house of significance like we had before, so the old folks are crying for what has been. And the Lord sent the prophet and he said, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former. Amen. Well, that, that temple never was what the other one was. And later on, the king came and redone that temple and it's called Herod's temple from then on. But he redone it and made it magnificent again. But the one they built then was not anything similar to the one that had been overlaid with gold and built without the sound of a saw or a hammer and the stones being hewed out uh, of the quarries and brought in and, and uh, fit together without any recutting or anything and the timbers being cut down up in Lebanon and shipped down in a raft after they were hewn, they were shipped and uh, bumping up against one another on the waves of the sea and then brought up to Jerusalem until they were smooth and they, they were uh, notched just right. And when they put them together, there was no cutting, no fitting, everything fit together. It was more than just the skilled labors. It was a hand of the Almighty God also. No, this second temple was not that way and it was not glorious in that sense. Then we find in the New Testament, they picked those verses up and brought them over to the church on this side of the cross and the glory of this house is greater than the former. Amen. This is what Paul, uh, this is what uh, God was telling him. You're not going to see my glory. Abraham desired to see my day, but he could not. He just got a glimpse of it. He embraced it. He loved it, Jesus said. But I'm going to tell you folks, we're living in the glory that followed the sufferings of Christ. The church is the most glorious thing that God has ever created. Amen. If we get our foot in the church, it's not enough. But when we get our hands and our head all in the church and our hearts in the church and we find the glory of God, this is the greatest thing God has ever created. Hallelujah. We're only a little group of people here. And I, I love the building. It's, it's such a beautiful building to me. I, I cherish what we have to worship in. But folks, whether you're under a shade tree, in your barn, in your home, wherever you're at, and God's glory shines on you, that really makes the church and the glory of God is revealed in our hearts. Amen. God shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. There was something all the way through the Old Testament, they were pointing to something that was to come, something that was to come. And the scriptures speak several times in the Old Testament, turn again our captivity, O Lord, like, like the, uh, yeah, of the south, springs of the streams of, uh, in the south. And over and over again, he's talking about turning again their captivity. 
When we got the year of Jubilee, our freedom, our liberty, and all the possessions come back to us. That's what happened on the 50th year. Every, every 50 years they had the Jubilee year. All of, all of the possessions returned to their rightful owners. All the land was restored to their rightful owners. You know what happened when Jubilee came to us? Everything that we lost in the sin of Adam, we gained in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is the glory that should follow. Those prophets of old, Peter said, they searched diligently what manner or what time the spirit of Christ that was in them did signify when it spoke of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister such things, which are now preached unto you by them which preach the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Somebody say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. In all essence, the Holy Ghost is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Praise God. Amen. When you get God on the inside of you, you've got what it takes, not only to make it to heaven, but you sit together with, in, with Christ Jesus in heavenly places right here. So Moses said, show me your glory. He said, you can't see my face. But now here's the title. There's a place by me. And I, I got thinking as I was driving to church, maybe I ought to have a dual title. There's a place for you. Every one of us, there is a place for you. Moses saying, God, I'm discouraged. You know that. I, I've tried. I've failed. They, they've rejected you. They've made a golden calf. I, you've moved out of the count and you've told me to bring them up. I don't know how to do this. I don't have enough help. And you said you'd go with me and I don't want to go without you going with me. But I, I need more than this. Show me your glory. What's coming, God? And he said, you're not going to see my face. But I want you to read a little bit farther with me. And the Lord said unto him, Behold, there is a place by me. Thou shalt stand upon a rock. It shall come to pass while my glory passeth by. I will put thee in a cleft of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. I wish that you would allow your mind, and we're gonna use this right here. I guess this would be about as good as any. This, there's a cleft. The word cleft there, it means a bore, B-O-R-E, like you've drilled out something, or it could mean a cave. It could mean a, a, an indention. You know, he's saying there, there's an open place in this rock, and I want you to come up and stand on this rock. There's a place up here by me. Moses, you can get very close to me, but when I pass by, while my glory is coming by, while my forefront is coming by, I'm gonna cover you up with my hand. Now, we all know that this has got to be a spiritual thing because or it, part of it is spiritual, part of it is gonna be literal, the cleft in the rock, the hole in the rock. We're on Mount Horeb, we're on Mount Sinai, and it, th this is literal. And I'm gonna put my hand, what about the hand of God? A, a spirit don't have flesh and bone as you see me have, Jesus said, but God is a spirit, but I'm gonna cover you. I'm gonna put my hand upon you and I'm gonna cover you while my glory passes by and then I will remove my hand. I'll make all my goodness to pass before you and you can see my back parts. All right, stand with me for just a minute. I don't mean stand, but I mean stay with me for just a minute and understand what I'm saying. You're not going to see what's in front of me, but I'm gonna let you see what's behind me. God does not have a hinder physique. He does not have shoulder blades, backbones, and things like that that you could see if he passed by and he moved his hand. Remember, God is a spirit. If his face consists of the things that are in the future, then his hinder parts consist of the things that are in his past. So he's saying, now Moses, I'm not gonna let you see all the things I've got for the people of God in the future, but I'm gonna show you what I've done for the people of God in the past. So Moses came there and stood and God caused his goodness to pass before him. I've got to hurry. This is really not uh, the main part of my lesson, but I want, I want to bring it in to, to tie this other end together. And he showed him his goodness. In the book of Genesis chapter one and verse three through verse four said, and God said, let there be light 
there was light. God saw the light, that it was good. God divided the light from the darkness. And God called, uh, well, let me, let me back up there. God said, let there be light. There was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. This is God's goodness right here. I mean, you know, he didn't like the darkness, so he said, let there be light. Four days, I mean, first day, this fourth day is when sun and the moon and the stars were created, but he made light in the first day, and he said it was good. In verse 10, God called the dry land earth and gathered together the waters called the sea, and God saw that it was good. This is God's goodness. And the earth brought forth grass in verse uh, uh, 12, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit and whose seed was in itself, after his kind, and God saw that it was good, God's goodness all over again. Evening and the morning were the third day. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven and divided the light from uh, the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That, that's the fourth day. In Genesis 1 and 16, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And uh, Last part of that, God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Verse 21, God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. We're still seeing the goodness of God. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creatures, verse 24, uh, after his kind, the cattle and creeping things and the beasts of the earth after his kind. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, and God saw that it was good. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That's after he created man. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So now where did we have this record? If you go to the book of Genesis and you read the title up there, it's going to say the first book of Moses. Genesis, the first book of Moses. We're aware that Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament called the Pentateuch, meaning, Pente meaning five. So he wrote this by revelation. Moses was not there. It's, it's been a long time. I mean, the children of Israel came out of the Egyptian bondage approximately 1500 B.C. Uh, so there was uh, almost 2,000 years, 1,656 years before the flood, from Adam to the flood. And then, of course, we have the whole story of Abraham, the children of Israel, and all of this taking place after the flood. And then about 1500 B.C., there was... Uh, Moses coming out of the of Egypt, but Moses wrote the things that happened way back in the in the beginning was uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. How did Moses know the details of what went on? How did Moses understand the call of Abraham? How did Moses know all the things that happened down in the land of Ur and how uh, they moved from there up into? Uh, uh, Padanaram, and how did he know about Abraham moving into Canaan land and God making all this promise unto him? God gave it to him by revelation. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, I can't profit you in my teaching unless I speak to you by revelation or by prophecy or by knowledge or by doctrine. Four ways to profit the church if you're speaking to them. You either are going to get a revelation from God or you already know this from God. How do you know things from God? Our best way of getting knowledge is, like Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, then if God's spirit falls upon you and you prophesy, he said, greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, unless he interprets that the church may have understanding. So if the Spirit of God falls and you prophesy, you're speaking directly from God and you can give the church knowledge that way. It's usually very limited and sometimes even obscure, but I'm gonna tell you, when you 
speak the doctrine. How do you know the doctrine? How do you understand the doctrine? Jesus said, if you'll do the will of God, you'll know my doctrine whether it's of God or not. So only children of God that walk with him are going to understand doctrine. So many times doctrine comes by revelation and a constant walk with God through prayer and fasting and seeking the face of God. You understand the doctrine of God. So those that have the understanding of the doctrine, those that have knowledge of God, those that are in tune with the Spirit of God and receive prophecy from God, and those that will just speak as God reveals it to them, uh, presently revelation, they can encourage and help and cause the church to understand. And God reveals himself to us by his word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Amen. So we're obligated to preach the word. But it, you know, if we just preach anything, I was mentioning earlier, one man told me one time, he said, used to, I, if there's something I didn't like, I preached again, it would have had Bible for it or not. I wanted to, I almost did, but it was, would have felt out of place for me. But I, all, I really wanted to say, that's the reason you got in the shape you're in. Because you can't preach the word by just making up your own doctrine. You, you can't edify folks by just preaching what you want to preach. And this man's wife helped me. She, she said, well, yes, you, you preach so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, which was no Bible for it. And, uh, of course, that was good enough. I didn't have to say anything. And I, I probably wouldn't have rebuked him at all. He was an elderly man. But I, I, my thoughts were immediately, that's the reason you got in the shape you got in. Folks, there's nothing like the Word of God. Now, the Word of God will bring us all the knowledge we need to know of God. And I, I, I think there's plenty of room for us to tell the relevant stories that will cause us to grasp the Word of God and give examples and, and uh, cause people to become interested in the Word of God. But our preaching and our teaching must be the Word of God and Word of God based if we're going to benefit anybody. If all we uh, talked about was Newsweek magazine, and, and I, you know, you may read an article in Newsweek and make a, a relation to things of God in the way that people are living, and that's fine. But we're going to have to give the word of God. Brother Fraser used to put it this way. You can catch a fish on artificial bait, but you're going to have to feed him something real if he's going to live. And that's true. You might get somebody stirred up and repent on, on something else, but if, if they're going to live, they're going to have to be fed the word of God. So Moses here is... Uh, Feet is being fed the word of God, but he's looking backwards and he starts at the creation and writes down the things that God revealed unto him. There was a place by God that was good for Moses to stand. You stand up here on this rock and you're going to be in a cleft and I'm going to put my hand over you and I'm going to pass by. I'm not going to let you see what's to come, but I'm going to let you see what I have done. Moses wrote it down. Moses gave us the history of God and his people from the beginning right on down unto his present time. Then he continued and gave us a history of them until they came into or unto the promised land. And then Moses was barred from the promised land. He died there in uh, the mountain before they got to the promised land. He could see it, but he could not go into it. Now then, I want to read you something else. I want you to notice this very carefully. In the book of 1 Kings, chapter 19, this is speaking of Elijah. And he arose and did eat meat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of the Lord. That's Sinai. That's the same place Moses was. In fact, over here where I was reading to you, one of the scriptures over there calls it Horeb, just above where I was reading in Exodus chapter 33, or it could be in Exodus 32, it's called Horeb there. Numerous places, Mount of the Lord, Sinai is called Horeb. So Elijah is discouraged. He's killed 450 prophets of Baal. He's made a real show for God. And then Jezebel says, I'm gonna kill him. So he fled, went a day's journey into Judea, got out of Jezebel's reach and her authority realm. And he dwelt under a juniper tree and an angel woke him the second time gave him food to eat 
And he arose and went in the strength of that 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb. We have Jesus that fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now we've got Elijah that has fasted 40 days and 40 nights. But he, he was eating on some angel food cake beforehand and uh, drinking heavenly water. It was, it was not just the old natural man, even though he had nothing to eat for 40 days and nights. And when he got to Horeb, where did he go there? He went into a cave. Now I'm telling you my opinion, okay? It does, it's not something to spell out strictly in the scripture, but he got in a cave. I believe it was the same cave that God put Moses in when he revealed himself to him. He's on the same mountain. Why would he spend 40 days and nights of traveling getting to Horeb? Why would he go in such an urgency until he got all the way to where Moses stood there? He knew the history. He knew that God showed up on that mountaintop. Why do we get up and come to church on Sunday morning? We know God shows up at church. Sure, you can have church in your home. We do, amen. We have worship service at home. We have, and of course, we don't have the good uh, piano playing. We don't have uh, all the preaching and all of the uh, teaching and so forth. But we have worship service at home. We have prayer meetings at home. We, you know, all of these things are good. But you know, God meets with us when we come here in such a way, it makes me want to come back. I want to be back on the next time that the church gets together. I want to gather together with them again because God meets there. Now, Elijah is in a, a dire strait. He's praying that he could die. He's discouraged just like Moses was discouraged when he met God on this mountain. And he winds up probably in the same cleft of the rock and the same hand of God comes upon him. He goes to the back of this cave and God speaks to him. And then he goes to the front of the cave and God causes the wind and, and storm and the fire. And, and uh, then finally, God speaks to him in a st st still, small voice. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, they've digged down your walters. They've killed your prophets. And I'm the only one left. Can you imagine the feeling of that way? I mean, you know, I, I kind of blame Elijah just a little bit, but I'm not going to speak bad about him. He's one of two men that left this place without dying. So, I mean, I can't rail on Elijah very much, can I? But he said, in so many words, I'm discouraged. They've digged down your altars. They've killed your prophets. And, you know, they, they've done disgrace to the God of heaven. Just let me die. God said to him, I've got 7,000 knees that have never bowed to Baal. And their lips have never kissed him. And that ain't all. I've got a future for this country. You get up from there and you go anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. You anoint Hazael to be king of Syria. Benadad was king at the time. You anoint Hazael to be, and you anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, to be a prophet in your room. It's not all going to leave here when you leave here, Elijah. You're not the only man I've got. You know, sometimes I really think in our discouragement, if we're, if we're walking close to God, we're aware that there's more of God moving than just in our lives. But in our discouraging ways, sometimes we get to thinking, look like everybody's about half backslid but me. It ain't, it ain't that way, folks. God's got a people, and he loves them people. And he'll have mercy on whom he'll have mercy, and on whom he will, he'll pardon Praise God. And that, that's the reason it's not left up to us to judge. But Elijah got there. there. Remember, there's a place for you. There is a place for you. I'm going to have to hurry. God, give him instructions. And let me just mention that Elijah never got to complete but one of those instructions. He anointed Elisha to be a prophet in his room. Elisha sent another young prophet to go anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. And Elisha is the one that went round, uh, down and told, uh, he met with uh, uh, Hazael and told him, you're going to be king over Syria and I can see that you're going to rip up the women with child and you're going to bash their heads against the stone. And he was weeping and crying. And Hazael said, uh, what, are you, what do you think I am? That I, I do something like that? He said, God has showed me what you're going to do. You're fixing to be the king over Syria. And Hazael turned around and went back to uh, the king of Syria and told him, said, Elisha said, you're going to be all right. You're going to recover from your sickness. And then he took a wet cloth and smothered him to death and reigned in his stead. I mean, the word of God's coming to pass. 
So Elijah got it started, but he didn't ever get to complete it. Now, there was a time in the New Testament, I'm going to have to just say it because I've got to quit. God made himself known in a great and a precious, a very unusual way. Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and they went up into a mountain. It's never mentioned exactly which mountain this is. It's called Mount Transfiguration a lot of times. But it is thought to be Mount Tabor. I wish that you could... I, when I was in Israel, I saw Mount Tabor. It's an outstanding mountain. It's not a big mountain. If you have ever went to Nashville up the old 31, and when you're topping a hill below Franklin, and you're going toward the north... And it just looks like God has took his teacup and just dumped teacups full of earth out just above Franklin. You can't see the town of Franklin hardly at this time, but you're looking over it and you're seeing these little mountains. I mean, you know, they're not big mountains, but they're just little pointed mountains. The Southern Army got on top of one of them for advantage during the Civil War, and the Union Army just camped round about it, right on the north edge of Franklin. The Battle of Franklin was fought there, and they didn't try to overcome them because they, they had the advantage in them uphill on the mountain, but they starved them out up there. They wouldn't let food go up and wouldn't let them come down, and they eventually just starved them out up there. But these little mountains are just so beautiful. Mount Tabor looks just like that. It looks like God just dumped a teacup full, and it's right in the edge of the Valley of Esdralon, which is one of the most beautiful valleys in the world. It's also called the Valley of Jezreel. It's also uh, in the valley that's between Nazareth, where they led Jesus out to the brow of the hill to cast him down, and then over on the other side where Elijah called down the fire out of heaven, and, uh, of course, Megiddo, which we know of as Armageddon, is there. This is the valley where the kings love to fight, this beautiful valley of Esdralon. And Sharon is in there where we have the song, the beautiful rose of Sharon. It's in this valley, but it's on over on the seacoast. And uh, Tabor is just a little mountain back at the other end of that valley. It's a beautiful little mountain. And, uh, but this is where they think that Moses and Elijah and uh, uh, Jesus were when Peter said, I was with him in the mount. I heard that voice that said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. I have a more sure word of prophecy for you. Folks, I wish you could feel what I'm feeling right now. Peter said, I know what it's like to be in that place by him. I know what it's like to be right there with him and see him transformed before my face and to see his clothes as white as snow and, and to see Moses and Elijah talking to him. I know what that's like to hear the voice of God, but he said, I've got a more sure word of prophecy for you. Amen. I was there with him. I heard the voice, but I've got the voice of God for you folks. There's a place for you. There's a place by God for you. God has a special place for every life that is here. And all that you have got to do is get in the place that God wants you in. And I can assure you the revelation of God will be yours. You can walk with power. You can walk with confidence. You can walk with faith because you was there with him. He's got a place by you. Remember this, there is a place by me, God said, and there's still a place for you in the presence of the Almighty God. Thank you for being inside.